That was not just a beautiful idea which Jesus announced to a curious crowd, but a principle in truth for all time. By it, all spiritual demonstrations are made. When you seek first the kingdom of God, then you are always on the right side of the law and in a proper state of mind to receive. Then God is with you and the universe is back of you, working for you, with you, and through you. All things work together for your good. When you try to reverse this process, however, by seeking things first, then everything is arrayed against you. All things work together for ill and everything turns out wrong. One reason why it is so hard to live by the truth in a confused world like ours is that we have become accustomed to evil. When Jesus healed the demoniac and the man became clothed in his right mind, the scripture says that the people were afraid. Afraid of what? They were afraid of right-mindedness. We have become so used to crooked thinking that we are afraid of straight thinking, so accustomed to bondage that we actually fear freedom. We are living out of our element, and so nothing turns out right. The New Yorker tells of an interesting experiment which bears on the situation. A pike and a minnow were placed in the same tank, but separated each other by a plate glass partition. The pike, time after time, tried to get the minnow, and each time received a severe blow from impact with the glass. Finally, after the pike had fully concluded that it was of no use, The glass partition was removed, and the minnow swam all about the pike without the pike making any effort to get it. The implications are obvious. The pike was limited by his own concepts, and even though the food, the minnow, was placed within his reach, he had not the ability to conceive that it was for him. The experiment aptly illustrates the divided mind, which is the reason we do not realize more health, peace, supply, happiness, and contentment. We have become so accustomed to our partitions that we never find the door. We become so hypnotized by the apparent that we never find the real. We become so crystallized in the limited that we never find the unlimited. Jesus said, Silence the old habits of belief. Part with the old concepts of limitation and defeat. Separate yourself from them. Cut them off. Strangle them. Let them die. Judge not according to appearances, but judge righteous judgment. Plainly see life in its true light. Look upon it as a whole. The growth of a tree is determined by the amount of sun, air, and moisture it is able to draw into itself. The growth of a man is determined by the number of false beliefs and erroneous concepts he is able to expunge or drop from his consciousness. A tree grows by the attraction of outside forces. A consciousness grows by the expulsion of inner enemies. You may pray and agonize from now till doomsday, but what is in your consciousness will come out in the body and in your affairs. Jesus did not ask that anything be added to him from the outside world, but only that he might uncover, or experience again, the glory that he had with God before the world or human mind was. The whole secret of quick and successful demonstration is, therefore, one's ability to separate himself, withdraw his attention from the undesirable, and keep himself centered in his mind in the kingdom of the desirable. The prodigal son tried to do this by running away. He tried to change conditions without changing himself, and it could not be done. Centered in self, he lost his friends, and there was no one to help him. He found what every other self-centered person has always found, namely, that what is in the seed will always come out in the plant. The right way, according to Jesus, is not to move from one location to another, from one set of circumstances to another, but to change our position in the law. To change our attitude toward God, look unto me and be ye saved, all to the ends of the earth. This is a law of plenty and freedom, for we are as rich or as poor, as healthy or as sick, as successful or as limited as the beliefs which we allow to occupy our minds. We are not separated from our blessings by persons, places, times, conditions, or things, but by our limited vision and our inability to see. The land that thou seest that will I give unto thee. Our contingencies, our problems, our troubles, our defects, our sickness and our limitations are all mental fixations or crystallized thoughts, which have so colored and clouded our vision that we are unable to recognize or experience right conditions. Jesus said, Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Rend the veil, change your thought, cleanse your vision, Get a better focus. Reverse the polarity of your faith. Increase your ability to see. See the fact instead of the fable. 
Look up and not down. Let go and take hold. Declare your Christhood. Adapt a new self and merit good instead of evil. When you have done these things, then you will be as powerful as you have been weak, as free as you have been bond, as healthy as you have been sick, and as rich as you have been poor. The depth of your valley is the height of your mountain. You will see more and therefore attract more into your experience. Why? Because you always travel in the direction you look. You always attract what you see and you always find what you are looking for. That is why Jesus said that a man's enemies shall be thy of their own household. The household is your consciousness and the enemies are your own negative reactions to the untoward things that happen to you. They are your own powers turned downward toward appearance instead of upward toward God. You have forgotten the fact and accepted the fable. Jesus said, Look up, for your redemption draweth toward you. There are always two in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. What are these two which are ever in the field? They are the possibilities of good and evil, the blessings and the curse, the fact and the appearance, the real and the unreal. Then how shall we change evil and imperfect manifestations? How shall we attract good instead of evil? How shall we use the Christ mind instead of the human mind? We have the answer in the scripture, Turn away your face from all your abominations and return unto me seeking my face. We do this by withdrawing our attention, and thus our power, from the negative appearance, refusing to have anything to do with in our thought, and by contemplating and embodying the spiritual fact, the truth as it is and ever remains in Christ. The law works in the exact way we use it. It is to us what we are to it. If it works for limitation, when we are wrongly related to it, when our thought is turned downward toward self, then it will work for abundance when we are rightly related to it, when our thought is turned upward toward God. The human mind of itself is incapable of thinking straight, drawing its evidence and conclusion from the surface and appearance of things. It thinks from the standpoint of limitation, instead of from that of plenty. When it is sad, it is because it forgets it is ever-present help of God. When it is sick, it forgets the man inside who always is well. When it is impoverished, it forgets the rich treasure of the kingdom within. In other words, the human mind forgets what is right and remembers only the wrong. Everything is in reverse. When trouble comes, it tries to meet it with ceaseless, misdirected, and purposeless activity of mind and body. It runs wildly here and there, seeking a way of escape. It looks to personality and material things for its salvation. Baffled in one direction, it seeks another equally bad. Failing in one plan, it adapts another of no more help. Being sensitive to trouble and misery, it absorbs them into the whole being until there is room for nothing else. Feeding on the husks of the surface, the human mind finally wears itself out and the whole nervous system is broken down. So having seen the human mind in some of its most destructive and disrupting moods, we naturally ask, how can the direful influence and the captivity of this mind be broken and its baleful effects removed? The answer is this, by turning away from the appearance, by quieting the mind and establishing yourself in the spiritual fact. In order to become free, you must not only reverse your thoughts and thus set the sight of the mind in the right direction, but you must also learn to think from the center, the standpoint of truth, instead of from the surface or the human mind. This is what we mean by streamlining mental action and what the metaphysician calls the parting of the ways by which you separate yourself from the undesirable and enter into the kingdom of the desirable. It is the means of purposely directing this seen sense of mind into the realm of divine reality. It is, therefore, the gateway beyond which lie all the infinite resources of God and the perfection which he has ordained for all men from the beginning. Now take your concordance and hunt up all the Bible references to the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, and you will soon see why this is the quickest and most direct route to everything good it is lacking in your life. You will see why it is that when you center yourself in it, nothing but good can get into your life. Jesus' teaching on the kingdom of God seemed paradoxical. In one instance, he referred to it as a coming kingdom, until the kingdom of God shall come. At another time, he referred to it as already here, the kingdom of God is within you. 
At still another time he referred to it as a present possession. Blessed are the poor, detached in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In yet another place he said that it must be sought. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things shall be added unto you. And again he said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. God's kingdom is not a visible kingdom with certain boundaries like the British Empire, a colony or a province over which a human king presides, but the invisible locality of his immediate presence. It is not on your hill nor in Jerusalem. It is not in one place more than another, not in one person more than another, not in one church more than another. It is anywhere and everywhere at the same time, all of it. It is wherever you are, in the same way that a radio program is wherever you are, although it does not come into manifestation until you tune in. If God is omnipresent, then his kingdom is omnipresent. Everywhere equally present, it is within all, through all, above all, and under all, and may be entered by any one who has a childlike receptivity. Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, be receptive and responsive to it, shall in no wise enter therein. Except one be born anew, changed, having put off the old man, he cannot see or experience the kingdom of God. In his parable on the seed and the leaven, Jesus pointed out that the kingdom of God is the most vital force in nature, in man in the same way the germ of vitality is in the seed. It grows in him through his recognition and realization of its presence. Just as the seed springeth up, and the earth bringeth forth fruit. When soil and seed are perfectly integrated, so man, when he synchronizes his power with God power, will furnish the condition to accomplish anything good he desires. That is why St. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ which strengthen me. When God power and man power, which are native to one another, are united, then is fulfilled the promise that I will give thee the desire of thy heart. This, then, is the gift we are asked to stir up, the kingdom of God and man, the vitality in the seed. It is already there waiting the chance to grow, to come forth. It is the great benefit, the great good, waiting to be revealed, the rich treasure hidden in the field, the lost coin, the net that was cast into the sea, the pearl of great price, the leaven in the meal, and the power in the mustard seed. It is the man inside, who is always well, that quickening influence which called Lazarus from the tomb, the transcendent power that healed lepers, straightened crippled limbs, opened deaf ears and blind eyes, stilled the storm and multiplied the loaves and fishes. Now let us turn to another aspect, the permeating influence of the kingdom of God, which Jesus likened unto leaven or yeast. The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, till the whole was leavened. Why do you suppose Jesus used the symbolism of three in this instance? Why not the measure of meal of four or six? There were two very definite reasons. First, he was talking to peasant people who had very little understanding of truth. He must use language with the least of them could understand. An ephah of flour, three measures, was the amount used for an average baking. Every peasant woman know that, and so none would miss the truth he was setting forth. Then, second, he was showing them the relationship between the kingdom of God and their individual lives, and making it plain that it must be kept perfect harmony functioning as a unit. The three measures of meal are also symbolical of the three phases of man's being, body, mind, and spirit. Just as leaven will permeate and transform a lump of inert, heavy dough into a fragrant and spongy mass, so the kingdom of God, if given a chance, will permeate and transform a man's entire life. It will not only conquer his ills and solve his problems, but will bring to him all the things necessary for a full, prosperous, and perfect life. The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven. And how does leaven work? It works in silence and by contagion. Like all other mighty forces, it is noiseless and deep. It transforms life, not by human aid or effort, but by its own inherent power. When Jesus taught us to pray, Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, he was not talking about a material utopia that was to be ushered in by human effort, collective bargaining and moral rearmament, social legislation or international cooperation, or to be accomplished by making all men Episcopalians, Roman Catholics, Methodists, or Lutheran. The kingdom of God cometh not by observation. 
It does not come just because we think in a certain way, pray in a certain way, or worship in a specified manner. It is not pure because we outlaw war, gambling, crime, or liquor. The kingdom of God is within us, waiting to be released. It is inward and invisible, like the leaven in the dough. It cannot be seen or touched, cometh not by observation. The kingdom of God is intangible but real, and worketh by contagion until the whole is leavened. It spreads through our realization in every direction until it has included everything good within itself. And who are the members of the kingdom of heaven? They are the God-centered, those who have established themselves in the consciousness of his presence, the detached, those who are in the world but not of it, the self-renounced, the self-surrendered, the impersonal, the one-pointed, the single-eyed. They are those disciplined from the center, the changed, the converted, the obedient, the receptive. They are those undivided in heart, the God-directed, the reconciled, the God-seekers, the relaxed, the poised, the pure in heart, the naturalized in God. Yes, the requirements are high, but membership is forever. It is the guarantee of everything good here and after. Releasing the Kingdom of God Our next inquiry in this realm leads into the part of the kingdom which vitally concerns you and me. When Jesus said that the kingdom of God is within you, he did not mean that it was in any part of the body as the heart, brain, or solar plexus. He meant that it was within your soul or true self. St. Paul said, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And again, let Christ be formed in you. Thus, to enter the kingdom of heaven, you need only to realize God's presence as a reality in your own soul. This means that you must fill your consciousness so full of God's presence and power that there is no room for the presence and power of anything else. In his book, Truth Ideas of an M.D., Dr. Southard says that a consciousness of anything is a mental awareness of it, a deep feeling that it is true, or an inner sensation of contact with it. The state is entirely a mental one and does not depend upon any position of the body or upon ceremonies. A consciousness seldom comes suddenly. We usually arrive at it by orderly steps after due mental preparation. A consciousness begins as an idea that is implanted in the mind, just as a seed is planted in the ground. Thoughts are then directed toward this idea and concentrated upon it, thus nourishing as the rain supply food to the growing plant. The idea draws these thoughts to itself, expanding continually until it fills the mind and becomes a mental state that governs all thinking. This is the parable of a mustard seed that grew to be a tree large enough for the birds to roost in. Implant in your mind the idea that God is always with you, that it is He who is working through you, no matter what you may be doing. Then concentrate your thoughts upon this idea, refer to it as a fact in all you think or do, and you will find it growing until you will feel as a great truth that He is actually right with you. You will then be in full consciousness of the kingdom of God. This is the realm of all good. When you establish yourself in this consciousness, you become aware that the source of all good is within you, just where the Master taught us that it is. God is our supply of everything, health, happiness, abundance, and love. These are all in that inner kingdom, waiting to be brought forth. You must become conscious of God as all good right within you before you can demonstrate these things in the outer. That is why Jesus told you to put the kingdom first, and why it is not only the quickest way to everything good, but the quickest way out of everything evil. You must first make yourself a magnet for the things that seem to be missing from your life. The kingdom is the magnet. And if you get your mathematics wrong, then your life will add up wrong. If you seek things before you seek God, then nothing will come out right. Your prayers will be clouds without rain. You will meet with frustration, delay, and defeat. The kingdom idea, on the other hand, works until the whole is leavened, until everything in your life is adjusted, renewed, transformed, and thrown into balance. Now let us think for a few moments about the words, His righteousness. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Why his righteousness? What is righteousness? There is a right side and a wrong side to everything, and to seek his righteousness is to keep yourself on the right side of life, judging not according to appearance, but according to the reality behind them. When you put the kingdom of God first, then you are always right. Then the universe is behind you, working with you and through you for the things you need. 
It also means having faith in God as a source of all good. You seek the kingdom of God by establishing yourself in the consciousness of His presence. You seek His righteousness by keeping yourself on the right or true side of the law, having faith in Him as a source of all your good, and letting His wisdom guide you in all that you think, say, and do. The magnet, of course, is your consciousness of the presence of God, the kingdom of heaven, and the result is the fulfillment of your desire. All these things shall be added unto you. Thus, those who are in the kingdom find that life works with them. Those outside the kingdom find that life works against them. Now turn again to the key of the beginning of this book, and you will see why it is that the quickest way of fulfillment of your desire is to make them of no importance in your thought. If the kingdom of God, as Jesus said, works like leaven, by its own inherent power, and contains all things within itself, then to seek things is to put the manifestation before the power of the manifest. It is to put the egg before the chicken, the oak before the acorn, the effect before the cause. It is to diminish power and to lose ground. The only important thing in life is God, and you have him in the possessive case, is to have everything else in abundant measure. Jesus made this very clear in his Sermon on the Mount. Take no thought for your life. Have no anxiety or concern about it. What ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. And again he asked, which of you can take thought, using the human mind, can add one cubit under a stature? He answered this by saying, if ye then be not able to do that thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? Then he illustrates the principle of involuntary living, laborless activity, by showing how God feeds and cares for the birds and fowls of the air, and the lilies of the field, which toil not, nor do they spin, and then tells us to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. How shall they be added? Without effort, without thought, and without using the human mind. Your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of these things, and it is his pleasure to give you the kingdom. How does he give you the kingdom? He gives it through your consciousness of it. When you have stopped taking thoughts about things, having made things of no importance in your thought, then you are naturalized in God. Then the Christ mind takes possession of your mind, and not only saves you from whatever you need to be saved from, but fills every vacancy and vacuum in your life. The laws of the kingdom are always self-acting. They become active in you just to the degree that you think with the mind of Christ and let his wisdom guide you. Get your center right, says Jesus, and everything else will be right. You do not need to demonstrate houses, money, automobiles, happiness, and health because those already exist for you. Your part is simply to accept them under the laws of the kingdom. You do this by establishing yourself in God's ever active law of good. St. Paul said, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, the crystallized thoughts of the human mind, and Christ shall give thee light. In other words, act as if you already are in the kingdom of God. Awake, and you shall know that you are. When the human mind tells you that you are poor, handicapped, captive, or sick, refuse to accept it. Still the human mind, believe, and you will realize the wonderful promise. You will realize that you are rich, free, well, and perfect. Capitulation. Since the kingdom of God is the cause of all good, and is native to us, or written in our inward parts, then to give it all preeminence in our thought will cause all things to work together for our good. What is lost will be found. What is missing will be supplied. What is sick will be made well. What is crooked will be made straight, and what is rough will be made smooth. What is abnormal will be made normal. What is wrong will be made right. What is bound will be made free. What is complicated will be made simple. What is impossible will be made possible. What is hidden shall be revealed. What is weak will be made strong, and what is poor will be made rich. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, to present your bodies a living sacrifice. Give your body to the kingdom of God. Give it to your brain to think with, your eyes to see with, your ears to hear with, your voice to speak with, and your limbs to act with. Then nothing but good will enter your life. Disease will vanish before it like shadows before the dawn. Problems and difficulties will dissolve like snow before the summer sun. Only give up your life and affairs to the kingdom of God, and he will manifest himself through you as all the good you can imagine. 
Your needs will be supplied in such abundance that there will be not room enough to receive them. All the author asks is that you try this out. Start today by establishing yourself in God's presence. Take the thought. God in me is the only presence and power in my life. I am conscious of this presence at all times and under all circumstance, and know that it is guiding me in every thought, word, decision, and act, and that it is filling me with all good. Fix this idea in your mind. Direct all your thoughts to it. If you will do this, it will expand quickly, and your conscience will bring back rich rewards from the greater kingdom within you. Remember, however, that there is nothing in the kingdom of heaven but God, and to put anything before him is to be deprived of that thing. Make your desire of no importance, therefore, and it will come back to you in the most unexpected way. With God all things are possible, and to be with God is to be in his kingdom, to be established in the consciousness of his presence. It is the quickest way to everything good, and the quickest way out of everything evil.